seven priorities uh, in the working of Satan in the last days. And if you have your Bible, open with me into uh, Revelation. If you're a brand new Christian, the book of Revelation is the very last book in your Bible. One of the things that I want to share in the beginning of the broadcast today is that uh, the timeline or the chronology of the subject that we're dealing with today uh, is already underway. This is not, uh, I, want, I want this to be abundantly clear, this is not something that is going to happen. Uh, it is something that has already started. And as we unfold the seven works of Satan in end time Bible prophecy, uh, you'll understand. But as we begin, if you're taking notes, this is really important. Uh, what we're talking today is prophecy. Uh, it is going to happen in the future. But I want you to be clear, it is already working now. Uh, the spirit of Antichrist is working now. Uh, a one world government system is working now. A one world monetary system and the staging for that is working now. A one world religion is working now. A one world military power is working now. All of these items, we covered this last week when we shared with you uh, the United Nations plan for bringing about a one world government with a one world leader in the next 11 years. And I would encourage you, if you did not view last week's broadcast, Go into the archives and view that broadcast. This is going to kind of tail into that same subject matter. But uh, it is not a conspiracy theory. It is not something that is uh, vague and hard to find. It is abundantly available. Uh, the United Nations has made it very clear. They have on multiple occasions addressed the fact that they have a strategic agenda for bringing about a one world government and a one world leader by 2030 is their announced and published goal, which is 11 years. And uh, so I want you to think about that as we're going into today's teaching. This is not something that is going to happen a long time from now. The seven major works of Satan in the last days are already birthed, already functional, already working, and uh, we're going to do our best to make that a little more clear to you today. Uh, one of the things that we are going to try to help you to understand is that uh, the midpoint of the tribulation is going to be uh, a definitive marked escalation in many of these final things that we're going to be talking about. But make no mistake, though we're not in the tribulation now, uh, we are in a point leading up to the Great Tribulation. If you're a brand new Christian of the Bible, uh, I know that I repeat this and I know that I uh, reiterate it over and over and over, but I hope that you'll learn it. But uh, I know that with 7,000 viewers last week, not all of them understand even the basics or the fundamentals of Bible prophecy. So as we're beginning today, uh, we're in a period of time called the Church Age. The church age is going to, it started in the book of Acts. It will conclude at an event called the rapture of the church from the book of Acts and the upper room experience to the rapture of the church. That is theologically called the church age. The church age ends at the rapture. And the rapture is the next major biblical prophetic event on the calendar of Bible prophecy. Immediately after the rapture, seven years of time called the Great Tribulation. The seven years of Great Tribulation uh, will occur in two parts. Uh, simply there will be a first half, three and a half years, and a second half of the Great Tribulation, three and a half years, for a combined total of seven years. One of the things that I want you to learn today is that at the three and a half year point, at that midpoint of the Great Tribulation, uh, the top is going to come off. Uh, the kettle is going to boil over. Whatever you want to use for analogy, 
there is going to be uh, a final ringing of the bell for the final round and Satan and all of his demonic workers and activities are going to have one final demonic intense surge of wickedness and evil and persecution in the last three and a half years of the Great Tribulation. After the last of the tribulation time, that seven year time, the second coming of Christ. And uh, if you're a new Christian again, I always try to emphasize the rapture is Christ coming for the church before the tribulation. The second coming at the end of the tribulation is Christ coming back with the church. And that will lead us into the millennial reign. And I'll stop right there with the prophetic chronology. But just to lay a found work a foundation of work before you as we begin. Uh, this is where we're going to start in understanding the seven priorities or the seven works of Satan in the last days. Uh, there is already a satanic warfare going on on this earth. Uh, I'm not going to spend any time on that because if you're not aware of what is going on in our world today, or if you're living with your head in the sand, uh, I don't know if there's much that I can teach that will help you. Uh, I mentioned that on occasions I've had people say, well, you know, we need to pray harder, or we need to fast more, or we need to teach on the church speaking in right confession over these last days. Well, I believe in prayer. I believe in fasting. I definitely believe in having your confession and your words in agreement with the covenant of God. But friend, don't ever forget this. No amount of prayer or fasting, are you listening? No amount of prayer or fasting on behalf of the church is going to escalate Bible prophecy or slow it down. Bible prophecy is on a calendar and an agenda set by the Almighty God of heaven and earth. And you can't stop Bible prophecy. There are many things that prayer and fasting and right confession can affect. I'm in no way defacing those. Uh, I'm not trying to take the power of prayer, the power of fasting, the power of keeping our mouth in our agreement with the positive plans of God I'm in no way trying to minimize that. I just want it to be clear that Bible prophecy is a divine, sacred agenda that has a chronology that has been set by God and nothing can escalate it and nothing can slow it down. So remember that as we're going forward. Uh, can prayer and fasting and the power of the church and the authority of the believer in the last days impact our world? Absolutely. And I am 100% committed to that. I have dedicated my life to traveling the world and doing my best to reach lost and unsaved and unreached people. I'll continue to pursue that under the coming of the Lord or my last breath. But I cannot stop the ticking of Bible prophecy by my work, nor can you. And unfortunately, there are many people who have either sat under poor teaching or poor doctrine that somehow feel uh, that they personally can help Bible prophecy or hinder end time prophecy. And the fact of the matter is you cannot. Prophecy in the Bible is set by God. It has a sacred agenda. And because God cannot change his eternal word, it will come to pass exactly as God has said it would be. So in the last days, again, we're still in the introduction, in the last days, satanic warfare in heaven and on earth, the worship of the Antichrist and the creating uh, of an idol in the great tribulation uh, is coming, and the death and the resurrection of the Antichrist. Uh, those are three things that I want you to have in your notes that will be critical during the last half of the Great Tribulation. Again, we're not in the Great Tribulation. Uh, I could uh, 
take a lot of time in establishing through Scripture why I know that we're not in the Great Tribulation. Uh, there are many who will say that we are. There are many who believe that the Great Tribulation already took place. Uh, but biblically, it is not so. The Great Tribulation is ahead of us, and the church is going to be raptured before the Great Tribulation. Uh, with that said, let me give to you in the infancy of this teaching the seven names of Satan in the Bible. Uh, and if you have your Bible, go to Revelation chapter 2 and verse 9. The Bible speaks to us here and tells us, I know your works, tribulation and poverty, but you are rich. And I know the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews and are not. Let me just pause right here. I, I can't bypass this. Uh, in my lifetime, there has been an incredible increase of messianic ministry. Uh, I thank God for pure messianic ministry. But even those who are in the leadership of messianic ministry would agree with me on this and probably uh, would be a lot more uh, dominant in their viewpoint there is a lot of ridiculous, I'm trying to be gracious here, unprofitable individuals involved in messianic ministry. And uh, some of these individuals go to great lengths trying to establish the fact uh, that they're Jewish. And uh, I'm thinking of several people that I've met through the years. Their minds, uh, their names are running through my mind. I'm not even going to mention them. But let me just tell you, there are some ridiculous attempts of people in the body of Christ trying to establish uh, their Hebraic roots and Jewish culture. Hey, if you're Jewish, you're Jewish. Praise God. But if you're not Jewish, you're not Jewish. And no attempt to pervert that and make yourself to be something that you're not is going to change that. I just find it interesting uh, for some of you to see this, that this is a part of the book of Revelation in Bible prophecy. The Bible speaks of the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. So there is the very first title for the devil in the book of Revelation, and his name there is Satan. Go down to verse 10. Do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested and you will have tribulation ten days. Be faithful until death and I will give you the crown of life. Verse 9, Satan. Verse 10, the devil. Now go over to Revelation chapter 12. I'm just taking time in the infancy of this teaching to show you the names of Satan and the devil in Scripture and where they're located. Revelation chapter 12 and verse 3. And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great fiery red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven diadems on his head. Uh, number three, the Bible addresses him as the fiery red dragon, or in uh, some Bibles it just is translated the great red dragon. Uh, go down to verse 9. Verse 9, the Bible said, So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world, he was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Here he is called the great dragon. Then in verse 9, uh, he's also called the serpent of old. And then in verse 10, the Bible says, Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren, 
who accused them before our God day and night has been cast down. Here he is called the accuser of the brethren. And that word brethren in the original text would include both male and female. The devil is the accuser of the children of God. And then in Revelation 12 and 9, and also in Revelation chapter 20 and verse 10, he is called the one who deceives the world. I take time to cover that as fundamental as it is, because one of the most common questions that I get in Bible prophecy is people are reading and studying the book of Revelation. Uh, they'll say, you know, who is the great dragon? Who is the accuser mentioned here? And so on. And so for those of you who are brand new to Bible prophecy, uh, this is important for you to understand. Uh, if you didn't get them, let me give them to you again. Number one, he's called Satan. Number two, he's called the devil. Number three, he's called a great red dragon. Number four, he's called the great dragon. Number five, he's called the serpent of old. Number six, he's called the accuser or the accuser of the brethren. And number seven, and lastly, the one who deceives the world. So with that in mind, let's get into the heart and the meat of today's subject. What are the seven end time works of Satan? Write that down. What are the seven end time works of Satan? I believe uh, Dr. Walford, the great prophecy teacher and scholar, has gone home to be with the Lord long ago. But I think he referred to these as the seven end time priorities uh, of Satan. And uh, they've been addressed in, uh, in many books and many prophecy teachings. Uh, they're really important and I want you to know them. Number one, if you're taking notes, and again, here's what I want you to have for a mindset as we're teaching on this. I want you to see the teaching today from Bible prophecy, from an end time chronology. I want you to see what we're teaching today within the greater context of why you're living in the world of chaos that you're living in now. Uh, for those of you who are watching this broadcast in America, I want you to see this teaching today within the context of why is America seemingly coming unglued? Why all of a sudden, all of this emphasis upon things that Americans have never stood uh, for in the past, nor tolerated in the past? Why all of a sudden is socialism uh, becoming acceptable and becoming a political platform? In a country where we went to war, our soldiers shed their blood to keep socialism and democratic socialism and communism and Nazism. We fought world wars and shed blood to keep that out of our country. Why is what some would refer to as democratic socialism why is that now a major political platform, not in some far third world country, why is that now the topic of discussion in the forefront of many political discussions in our own country? Why do we have elected officials and presidential candidates and senators openly attacking Israel, the Jewish people, anti-Semitism. Why all of a sudden has this become an acceptable viewpoint and an acceptable political uh, argument and platform, not only among people that are elected officials and governors and senators and so on, but in upcoming presidential candidates? Why? And uh, I could just go down the list of things that we're seeing in America that most of us who have a little gray hair uh, at this point in life, it, you can't help but scratch your head and wonder what in the world is going on in this country. I would argue with you that America right now is in a more volatile position than it was prior to the events that led up to the Civil War. 
and I chose my words carefully, I am telling you that I personally believe as a student of history that America is in a more chaotic, hateful place now, a more divided position now than it was in the events that led up to the Civil War. Uh, the events of American history that caused the Civil War, uh, you could put most of those problems uh, in a handful of categories. Uh, not so today. The intensity of division is not one issue. It's multiple issues that have divided our country. Those of you were using social media for the propagation of the gospel, but social media by and large is just an open venue of spew of hatred and divisiveness and argument and individuals and name calling and so on, I want you to see today the context of what I'm teaching out of the book of Revelation and end time prophecy and the seven final works of Satan. I want you to see how this is not a work. This is not something that is going to come in the great tribulation. It is already here. It is already active, it is already working, and the escalation of it is not going to go away. It is going to continue to escalate. The Bible says, listen carefully, that the rapture of the church and the removal of the bride of Christ from planet earth is going to take away, are you listening, the restrainer. The Bible calls that time and the church and the rapture, the removal of a restraining force. So you have to ask yourself the question, if we are already living with the chaos and the hatred and the division and our nation and the very fabric of America being torn apart before our very eyes, if we're already living with this dysfunction and this level of wickedness, imagine what it's going to be like when the restraining power of the church and the righteous are removed by means of rapture. Once the church is gone, then a literal hell on earth is going to come into that vacuum. So number one, the seven end time works of Satan. Number one, Satan is going to lead a false, unholy, Trinity. Now Satan has always tried to counterfeit or replicate uh, the things of God because he's not God and he's not even a God. Uh, sometimes when I listen to preaching and teaching it becomes apparent by verbiage and things that are spoken from the pulpit that people ascribe way too much power and authority to Satan and to the fallen angels. Satan is not a God. Satan is a defeated fallen angel. Does he have power? Yes. Does he have authority? Yes. Is he impacting our world, our society, our education, our politics, and so on? Absolutely. But does he have any power over God? No. Does he have any power over Jesus Christ? No. Does he have any power over the Holy Spirit? No. Does he have any power over the victorious church of the Lord Jesus Christ? No. Does he have any authority over believers who are walking in right relationship with God and living under the covenant? Absolutely not. Satan has no power over the church and the children of God. But the ungodly? Absolutely. Just this week, uh, I received uh, a picture and a prayer request. Uh, a pastor uh, and a church that I've ministered at uh, apparently, uh, the occult or witches or somebody involved in Satanism came to their church and drew some type of satanic emblem in the parking lot, or I'm not exactly sure the location, 
and uh, they put down some type of what looked to be a satanic offering. Uh, there was a dead bird wrapped in some type of leaf, and uh, I saw several other things in the picture that was forwarded to me. And the question was asked of me, do you have any idea what this is? My response was, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what devil, what demon, what witch, what war warlock, what any power of the devil tries to bring against the church, it has no effect upon the blood-bought and the redeemed. I think of many years ago, R.W. Schambach, uh, there was a story he told when he was pastoring a lady in his church. Uh, there was a witch in town that hated this woman, and this Christian woman called, uh, at that time it was Pastor Schambach, and uh, she was distressed, and she said, this woman has come to my door, and she has sprinkled some type of evil powder all over my doorstep, and has drawn some type of satanic sign in it, and I can't get out of my house without stepping in it. Uh, Pastor, what should I do? And Pastor Schambach, if I remember the story, said, here's what I want you to do. Are you listening? She said, yes, I'm listening. He said, take your shoes off. She said, what? He said, take your shoes off. She said, all right, pastor, my shoes are off. What should I do now? He said, open your front door and go out and dance all over it because greater is he who is in you than he that is in the world. And we need to be reminded in the last days, as you've heard me say a thousand times, Bible prophecy is not given to scare us, but Bible prophecy is given to prepare us. And though, as I'm teaching today, there is a scenario and a plan prophetically in place for Satan and the fallen angels and the godless and the wicked in the last days, this should not in any way cause any disturbance or any distress in the heart of the child of God. Because the power of sin and Satan are under our feet and we have been given dominion over the works of the devil. Can I hear a praise God somewhere out there? We have power over the devil. And so I want to make this just as clear as possible as we're talking about the seven works of the devil in the last days. These are not in any way, shape, or form going to bring to us some type of of discouragement or defeatism. We are victorious through it all. This will just better help you to understand why we're living in the world in which we're living. If you have your Bibles open to Revelation chapter 13. Revelation 13 and verse 2. Now the beast which I saw was like a leopard. His feet were like the feet of a bear, and his mouth like the mouth of a lion. The dragon gave him power. His throne and great authority. Now turn over to Revelation chapter 16 and go down to verse 13. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs coming up out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are spirits of demons performing signs which go out to the kings of the earth and to the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. And so do you see it in these passages? Three unclean spirits, the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. So here is the first working of the devil in the great tribulation in the last days. He is going to formulate and eventually unveil a unholy trinity. Again, Everything the devil does is to pervert the original of God. The original Holy Trinity is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The unholy Trinity, the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. 
even the mark of the beast, and we've taught on this and we'll come back to it because it's, uh, it's interesting to see how this one world currency is beginning to fall in place uh, across the globe. It will evolve and we'll probably, we may see uh, the mark of the beast in the sense of this one world currency. We may see it as it actually will be or we may see uh, the prototype of it. We may see it in its infancy. I don't know. But it will continue to evolve with technology because it will not be fully implemented until halfway through the Great Tribulation. That's why you don't hear me do a lot of teaching uh, and being specific about barcodes and monetary tattoos and RFID chips and implants, etc. Uh, they are all perhaps leading towards something in technology that will be the mark of the beast but they're not the mark of the beast and the true mark of the beast, we may never see it. It may not be fully implemented until after the rapture of the church and may not be fully announced until halfway through the great tribulation. And so that's why I don't spend a lot of time in what I call sensationalism. I, uh, I've said it before, again, let me be gracious, but I am strongly opposed and would discourage you from listening to, reading, or buying books from people who use prophecy to bait the body of Christ through sensationalism. Always taking something, uh, it's called, in my eyes, I call it prophetic clickbait. You know, something to just stir up the church and to sell a book and to make the almighty dollar on the children of God sometimes, I fear, is their only pure motive because the scholarship behind it is just absent and the theology behind it is either absent or twisted. So I encourage you from time to time, I'll pause to do so now, abstain from people who use Bible prophecy and sensationalism. But the mark of the beast is actually a replication of God's mark because the Bible tells us that before the mark of the beast is implemented, that God is going to mark the foreheads of the 144,000. Don't have time to teach on that today, but just to point out to you that the unholy trinity, the beast and the dragon and the false prophet, the unholy trinity, it's a replication of the holy trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the mark, and we could go down a list of many things that Satan is counterfeiting because he does not have the power nor the creativity of the God who created him. So number one, he'll lead a false and unholy trinity. Number two, he and his demonic army are going to be cast out of heaven by the archangel, and in particular, the archangel whose name is Michael. Uh, this is, again, we're talking about the seven works of Satan and end time prophecy. One of those works is the beginning of his demise that he is going to be cast out of heaven along with demonic powers by the archangel whose name is Michael. Uh, Revelation chapter 12. If you're taking notes and you have your Bible, Revelation chapter 12 and verse 7. And war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon and the dragon and his angels fought, but they did not prevail. Nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. So one of the things that I want you to see in this battle where Michael revokes the passport of the devil and the demonic fallen angels and casts them to earth. Now, some of you are surprised that at this point in church history and at this point in Bible prophetic history and future events, Many of you are surprised and maybe ask the question, why 
has God still allowed Satan and demons to have access to heaven? It's a good question. And uh, again, I'm going to have to stay on point today with where we're headed. Uh, I'll come back and deal with that at some teaching in a, in a greater degree. But what I want to point out today is that you need to remember this. Satan, as of now, still has access to the presence of God. Demons still have access to heaven and the presence of God. The Bible tells us, and we already covered this, I'll not go back, but part of his work is he's an accuser of the brethren. Where do you think he's doing that accusing? Where do you think he's trying to make his case made? Now, again, I don't want to get into the teaching of it today because I'll never get uh, finished with what I've announced. But just to help you to better understand, because I know some of you are already scratching your head, I don't want you to think that Satan and fallen demons have access to heaven in full privilege, because that's not biblically correct. Think of them having access to God as a prisoner would have access to a judge. Uh, there has to be a permission granted. And he is not roaming around in heaven and enjoying the benefits of heaven nor the demons. But the Bible's not absolute clear in every detail pertaining to this other than God who sits on the throne in all authority, Satan, according to the Bible, this we do know from Scripture, has the ability to request an audience with God. And it's there that he presents his case. It's there that he brings accusation. It's there that he brings his false statements. It's there that he is the accuser of both you and I. But I want you to see that in the last days, in the seven end time works of Satan, the second end time work of Satan is his passport is going to be revoked. And he is going to be cast out of heaven upon this earth and there will, there will never be audience again. Number three, the seven end time works of Satan. Number three, he will persecute the Jewish people. Revelation chapter 12, go down to verse 13. Now when the dragon saw that he had been cast to the earth, he persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child. Child. This is speaking of the Jewish people. It is speaking of Christ being birthed as a Jew uh, in Jewish lineage. And the Bible here tells us that he's going to persecute the woman who gave birth to the male child. But the woman was given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness to her place where she is nourished for a time and times and a half of time from the presence of the serpent. So I want you to pay careful attention. The persecution of the Jews that is going to escalate to its highest point in all of human history, in all of Bible history, is going to occur during the Great Tribulation. The reason why I'm asking you to pay careful attention to this is this is the reason why you're seeing elected senators multiplying in numbers, openly spewing anti-Semitism, openly speaking against Israel. Uh, one or two current senators will not even use the word Israel. They refer to that land wrongly as Palestine, which it doesn't belong to Palestine. Israel, think of this. Israel is not only a recognized international state. America is her greatest ally. And we have elected senators who won't even acknowledge the statehood of Israel. And their hatred is apparent. And uh, there's a bill that I saw yesterday uh, being passed by one senator. And uh, I'll not get into it. But there are voices in political power who hate Israel, who are openly anti-Semitic, and have no problem beating the drum loudly in anti-Semitism. I could take steps out in that ripple effect, and we could go all over the world 
and highlight escalation of anti-Semitism. But what I want you to see, again, within the context of Bible prophecy, is this is part of the last work of the devil in the end times, and it's going to get worse and worse. And when the church is removed, it is going to escalate almost out of control. Number four, he will know that his time is short, so he is going to pour out his wrath upon this earth. Revelation 12 and 12, Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down to you having great wrath because he knows that he has a short time. Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. The devil has a short time. It again, just the reading of that verse should encourage you because it highlights that he's already defeated. His day of being exterminated. His day of being revoked from heaven. His day of judgment is already predetermined by the Almighty God of heaven and earth. And friends, I want to say it loud and clear, the devil is not in charge of final Bible prophecy. The United States government is not in charge of final day prophecy. The Democratic Party, nor the Republican Party, nor the Independent Party, nor any national power has any control over final Bible prophecy. Jesus said, My Father only. Matthew chapter 24, verse 36. No man knows the day nor the hour that the Son of Man will return. No, not the angels in heaven, but my Father only. Those four words, highlight them. But my Father only. Only the Father has control over the unfolding and the chronology of final Bible prophecy, and the devil's days are numbered. Can I hear a praise God out there? Let me read to you something that Dr. Mark Hitchcock wrote. He wrote, quote, One of the things that will make the Great Tribulation so terrible is the extreme rage of Satan that he will unfurl. In these last days, when he is cast from heaven to earth, when his uh, passport, I use that terminology just as uh, a way for you to have something to, to think about, but uh, obviously the devil doesn't have a literal passport. But the devil's ability to have access and audience with God is coming to an end and when he, by the archangel Michael, along with all of the fallen angels, are thrown out of heaven, and a line is drawn in Bible prophecy, where Satan never again has audience with God, never again has the ability to accuse the brethren, never again is brought into a place where he can debate or make his argument before God. He's cast to this earth. It is going to release the most incredible demonic hatred, rage, and frustration that will contribute to the apocalyptic events of the Great Tribulation. Number five, he will accuse God's people before the throne. Revelation 12 and 10, Then I heard a loud voice saying, In heaven now salvation and strength in the kingdom of our God and the power of His Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren, who accused them before our God day and night, and has been cast down. Again, some of you perhaps in this teaching are surprised to know that Satan throughout all of time, up until this period that we're teaching on, has had access to God, has had audience with God, demons have had access to God, they have had access to heaven, and again, uh, not in a capacity of being a citizen, uh, 
Uh, in no way do I want you to think, nor am I teaching, nor does the Bible teach, that Satan and the fallen angels have had free liberty in heaven uh, to do whatsoever they have wanted. They have had access to heaven, access to God. Uh, and again, the analogy, think of it in terms as someone that makes an appointment and is brought into a court to stand before a judge, uh, only as the judge allows. And that is the biblical theology of that in a nutshell without teaching on that in today's uh, subject matter. But many of you have been surprised perhaps to understand that up until this point, Satan and the fallen angels have had this access. But he, he uh, accuses God's people, but that will come to an end. Dr. John Walford said, From this point on in Revelation, therefore Satan and his hosts are excluded from the third heaven. Now, I want you to get this. Uh, Dr. John Walvoord is, is one of the greatest Bible prophecy scholars perhaps who's ever lived and uh, absolutely brilliant and prolific author. And I think I have all of his books in my library. Uh, perhaps, and again, one of the most respected voices in Bible prophecy. Listen to his words. Pay attention. He said, quote, From this point on in Revelation, therefore Satan and his hosts are excluded from the third heaven, the presence of God, although their temporary dominion over the second heaven, pause right there, what's the second heaven? Uh, that refers to space, the prince and the power of the air. Uh, I, I hesitate to use the phrase outer space because uh, those of you that are not scientists think in terms of sci-fi movies, but Satan has access and power uh, in space, uh, the prince and the power of the air. So when Dr. Walvoord speaks of the second heaven, he's, he's speaking about space. And the first heaven. Now, uh, the first heaven is the sky, uh, the atmosphere closest to the earth. The presence of demonic activity uh, does move and maneuver in the skies that surround our globe. Let me read that last sentence again since I've interrupted his thought. Satan and his hosts are excluded from the third heaven, the presence of God, although their temporary dominion over the second heaven and the first heaven continues. Satan's defeat in heaven, however, is the occasion for him to be sent down to the earth and explains the particular virulence of the great tribulation time. Well said. Number six, we're talking about the seven end time works of Satan. Number six, he will deceive the world. Turn over to Revelation chapter 20 and verse seven. I'll give you a moment to get there. Revelation chapter 20, verse 7. Now when the thousand years had expired, uh, this speaks of the millennial. When the thousand years had expired, Satan will be released from his prison and will go out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle whose number is as the sand of the sea. Here the Bible shows us that he is going to have one final surge of demonic deception. Uh, go down to verse 10, as long as we're in Revelation 20. The devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are, and they will be tormented day and night forever and forever. Praise God. So again, uh, we're talking again the seven final works of Satan in the last days. We're teaching this within the context of taking a step back from the teaching and seeing what's going on in our world today 
And as a believer, it helps you to understand why we see the chaos, why the divisiveness, why the hatred, why the splintering of our own society and our own culture, even here in America, built upon Judeo-Christian values, uh, being torn apart before our very eyes, being mocked. We take a step back through Bible prophecy, and now we understand why. This is a part of the process leading up to the final works of Satan. And before I conclude with the last one, I want you to see in this sixth the word deception. If there's one word that I hope that you'll learn from me in Bible prophecy, one of those words that would be in my top ten list of words I would want you to understand in Bible prophecy and relate to in Bible prophecy is the word deception. In the studying of Bible prophecy, multiple times you're going to see the word deceive, deception, deceived, etc. You are going to see that one of the great works of Satan in the last days is going to be deception. This is vitally important to you and to myself because this deception, unfortunately, has infiltrated and polluted the entire church of the Lord Jesus Christ. There is a great deception in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ now. There is great de deception in doctrine. There is great deception in worship. There is great deception in leadership. There is great deception on fundamental doctrines. There is great deception on salvation. There is great deception on grace. There is great deception on signs and wonders and miracles. There's great deception on many of the great doctrines of the church age. We're not just talking about deception in the world, although it's going to be prolific. But the deception, make no mistake, is in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ now. That's why you constantly hear me ask of you humbly, will you allow me to be your trusted voice in Bible prophecy and in the proper interpretation of Scripture. Not because I'm a great theologian, not because there aren't people far more educated than I in the matters of Scripture, but because I give to you a pledge and a promise that when I come to you with the Bible, I'm not coming with an agenda. I'm not coming trying to be the talking head for a denominational voice. I have a deep feeling in my heart and a deep conviction that I have a responsibility be, to be true to the unadulterated word of the living God. I'll be judged one day for how I handled the scriptures. And I pledge to you, and I promise afresh to you today, I'd like to be your trusted voice for Bible teaching and Bible prophecy because I'm not going to be a part of that last day deception. And I don't want you to be either. Lastly, Number seven, Satan is going to lead a final rebellion against God. Revelation chapter 20. Let's go back to verse seven and let me just read a few verses here before I close. Now when the thousand years had expired, Satan will be released from his prison and he will go out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, whose number is as the sand of the sea. They went up on the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city. And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. The devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Verse 11, Then I saw a great white throne, and him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. 
The sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them, and they were judged, each one according to his works. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death, and anyone not found, written in the book of life, was cast into the lake of fire. What victorious words, but what sobering words as we conclude today. Satan, though he is going to lead one final rebellion against God and God's children, the Bible said that God is not even going to get up from the throne. It's not going to be like an MMA match where Satan and God square off in the last round both cut and battered and bleeding. God from heaven in majesty and power is going to send out judgmental fire from heaven and consume Satan and every fallen angel, every demonic spirit. And the Bible said that they will be put into a place of eternal judgment and will be held there in judgment and great torment forever and forever. Satan's days and demonic warfare and demonic spirits and wickedness and ungodliness, listen to me, their days are numbered. So when you see ungodliness in our world, when you see wickedness in our world, when you see the fabric of America being shredded and perverted before your very eyes, when you see sexuality shredded and reinvented in perversions beyond imagination before the eyes of your family and your children, when you see education shake its puny fist in the face of a holy God, when you see an assault against the church and against believers and against Pentecostalism. Be reminded of my words today. Satan's days are numbered and our days are without number. For we shall rule and reign with him forever and forever. Those who endure to the end shall be saved. Praise God. Are you going to be an endurer? Or are you going to develop a dysfunctional and poor attitude and buckle under the weight of the end time scenario? No, I'm teaching what I'm teaching today because I want you to see what the Bible says in Bible prophecy, but I want you to see it not just from an intellectual standpoint. I want you to see it within the context of the world that you're living in right now and to know this is prophecy escalating before your eyes. So don't be discouraged by it, for it means that our day is getting closer and closer and closer. This is not a day to quit. This is not a day to give up. This is not a day to be discouraged. This is not a day to wander away from faith. This is not a day to enter into sin and to temptation. This is a day to renew your commitment. I am going to live steadfast under the sound of the trumpet of the Lord and unto the rapture of the church. I will live faithful to the Lord with no turning back. And you must purpose in your heart. I'm not only going to stay saved. I'm going to take a crowd of people with me when I go. Your friends, your family, your loved ones need to understand the breadth of this message and to live every day ready. The last verse that I read to you, the Bible said in Revelation 20, that anyone whose name was not found written in that book will also be cast into that lake of fire. I conclude with a simple question. Do you know beyond the shadow of a doubt that your name is written in the book of life? If Jesus Christ were to come today, do you know that you're ready? Are your sins forgiven? Is your heart clean? Is your commitment steadfast? Is your consecration sure and immovable? Are you living in victory over sin or is sin living in victory over you? 
Listen, I never close a broadcast without praying what many people call a sinner's prayer. And I'm not here to judge anybody or to be harsh or to point a finger of accusation. As you've learned today, that's the work of the devil. The devil is the accuser of the brethren. But those of us who are the children of the Most High God should seek to help and to encourage and to restore even those that are fallen and away from the Lord. So can I do that with you? If you're watching today and you're not sure you're ready for these last days, if you're watching today's broadcast and you've never made peace with God, if you're watching today and somehow you've backslidden and wandered away from your faith and today you need to come home to Christ, lean upon that mercy now while there is yet time. The Bible still says, all who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you need to pray that prayer with me, I'm going to ask you to pray it with me sincerely right now. And if when you pray with me today to give your heart to Christ or to come back to Christ, when you're done praying with me, I always ask, just in the comment section there on your screen, type the word amen after we're done praying. I go back at the end of every broadcast and it's a way of seeing how many prayed that sinner's prayer with us and we'll pray for you and we want to help you. As a matter of fact, when we're done praying in just a moment, I have something that I want to give to you as a gift. But if you need to pray that prayer, just right where you're at right now, pray with me. Just say out loud, Heavenly Father, today as I was listening to the Bible, you were speaking to me. It is my desire to live ready to meet the Lord Jesus Christ. Today I confess my sin and I trust in the grace and the mercy of the Lord. I ask you to forgive me. Come into my heart. Be my Lord and my Savior. Father, today I repent. I not only recognize my sins, but I turn my back on sin and I turn my heart to Jesus. Fill me with the Holy Spirit and give me the power to live a victorious Christian life. Make me what I ought to be. In Jesus' name, I receive salvation as the gift of God. And I'll never be the same. In Jesus' name, amen.